Leo is on the air. Flash. Not one, not two, not three, but four. Four great movie stars, gloriously, uproariously together in one great picture. William Powell, Myrna Loy, Gene Harlow, Spencer Tracy. Rowdy runaround of romantic errors. The Metro Goldwyn Mayor romantic comedy, Libeled Lady. The plot of Libel Lady is ingenuously spun around the escapades of a $50 million heiress, played by Myrna Loy, a daughter of the rich who damages easily, much too easily, to suit the editor of a New York daily newspaper, played by Spencer Tracy. Can't I stay away from here for one day without somebody pulling a boner? You call yourself a newspaper man. Where was your nose? My nose? Yes, your nose. Well, that thing fairly reeks of alcohol. Jackson was drunk. You gotta smell things like that. You don't need any brains. All you need is a nose. I knew the boss hated her father. Her so father I... hates us. And he'd give his right eye to blow us up, and you hand him the dynamite. The one girl in the world that we should handle with kid gloves. You got a name spread all over the front page there? What do you want? What do we use for a new headline? I don't care anything. War threatens Europe. Uh, which country? Flip on nickel. Yes, sir. The boss is here. He wants you right away. Does he want me or my job? Have you got a drink? Yes, there's a fresh bottle on your desk. I thought you'd need it. Uh, and how? Scandalous headlines have injured the finer senses of the fragile Connie Allenberry to the tune of, so she thinks, five million dollars. The editor, frantically trying to squirm out of his unpleasant predicament, decides to telephone London and throw himself on the mercy of the girl's father, Walter Connolly. Hello? Hello, Mr. Allenbury? This is uh, Warren Haggerty of the New York Evening Star. You know the star? <laughs> the early edition of the paper carried a little item about your daughter. Uh, not that the item was serious, you understand, but uh, that's it, that's it, just the... Uh, uh... Spirit of fair play. <laughs> I appreciate that spirit of fair play, Mr. Haggerty. But you see, my office tabled me a copy of your little item. Yes. Yes, indeed. Hardly what I'd call innocent. Oh, I'm not interested, Mr. Haggerty. You can discuss that with my attorney. Now, hold on a minute. This is Charles Archibald of Archibald, Davis, and Wingert. We are filing suit immediately through our New York office. You'll receive the papers tomorrow. Just a minute, Mr. Archibald. Don't forget to mention the amount we're suing for. By the way, you might inform your Mr. Bain, Miss Allenbury is asking damages for five million dollars. His best rehearsed entreaties have fallen on the deaf ears of Allenbury and his daughter. Haggerty's next move is to call upon his friendly enemy, Bill Chandler, played by William Powell. Chandler is a ladies' man of the first order, upon whom Haggerty can depend to trick Connie into some sort of compromising position which will force her to drop the suit. Haggerty and Chandler hatch their plot over a cup of coffee. More coffee, sir? Oh, uh, no, thanks. Thank you. Well, now, Warren, what's on your mind? I've been thinking, Bill, after all, you're a newspaper man and a darn good one. Maybe I was a little hasty when I... You uh... don't mean to say you want to give me back my job again. That's it. Start right in where I left off. Same salary, same desk, everything just the same. Until the next time you get indigestion. It wasn't indigestion. Oh, wait a minute. You want to talk business? All right, I'll talk. You're in a jam over the Allenbury girl. You run a hot story and she's suing you. Who told you? Elementary, my dear Watson. I saw the story, first edition only, and carried by no other paper. That, says I, is the fine Italian hand of Haggerty, the bull in the china shop. How much is she asking? Five million dollars. <laughs> Who does she think she is? Just one of the richest girls in America. Yes, I know all about her. Runs away from a girl's school, flirts about with royalty. Becomes engaged to Count Alberto. Jilts him. Title crazy. 
with a fat-headed old father, a buyer in and out. America's international playgirl. That's her rep, and she thinks it's worth five millions, huh? Well, when I get through with her, she'll take five cents. Done. You're on the payroll. Oh, no, Warren. No more philanthropy. During the six months that I was on the star, I saved you all told some $300,000. What did I get? 125 bucks a week. That's the proposition now, my lad. Drawn yesterday. I've been expecting you for 24 hours. $5,000 down and 45000 more when you... Why, you're crazy. There isn't a report in the world that gets that much money. It's robbery. All right, forget it. You read any good books lately? Oh, now, be reasonable, Bill. Take it or leave it. Sir. Now, wait a minute. On second thought, I don't think I want the job at any price. I've got all the money I need right now. Look here. I just got this letter from my publishers, offering to advance me another 5000 on a second book. Let's just forget about this. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Look, wait a minute. But... You ought to be arrested for extortion. I knew I was a sap to That's believe... right, you were. But you'll get your money's worth. Now, here's the plan. The Allen Burries are in London. So I sail for England at once. But they're coming back in ten days. That's why I'm sailing, to come back with them. On the boat. Five days. Anything can happen on the boat. I meet the girl. Perhaps she comes to my cabin. Oh, no, no, no. Not this girl. Only for a cocktail. Perfectly innocent to her, to me, to everyone on the boat. Except our private detective. Who radios my wife. You got a wife? No, this is a setup, not a confession. But we hire some attractive girl to marry me, and when the time comes, she stages a pretty little scene over her erring husband and sues Connie for alienation of affection. That's it, that's it. The star called Connie a husband stealer. She denies it. All right, now we duplicate the situation. This time she does steal a husband. This time we're right. Let her go to bat with a libel suit after that and see what she'll collect. But how about this girl to marry you? Do you know anybody? Well, that's tricky. We've got to find somebody we can trust. I've got the girl. The very girl. Waiter, waiter, where, where's the telephone? Uh, hello. Well, what happened to you? Do I want to get married? Well, what do you think? I'll call the preacher right away. The city hall. Well, then I can't wear my wedding gown. All right, I won't ask any questions. Sure, I'll be there. And don't keep me waiting. Tiny? Tiny, come here. Yes, ma'am? Oh, I'm so happy. Today's my wedding day. What again, Miss Gladys? is decided to join in sinister matrimony Bill Chamber and Haggerty's fiance. Only a temporary arrangement to be sure, but an arrangement which is entirely unsatisfactory to fiance Gladys Benton, played by Jean Harlow. Gladys starts the fireworks. The things I've taken for that paper one, Haggerty, but this gets the blue ribbon trying to marry me off to that to that baboon. Yeah, let's not deal in personalities. Oh, but darling, it's only for a month, maybe less. And then six weeks in Reno. And Miss Benton, you'll love Reno. They've got the duckiest little place out there where you can shoot craps every night. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. And I'll come for you the moment you get your divorce. But I don't want a divorce. I want to get married and stay married. If you don't want to marry me, just say so. Darling, of course I want to marry you, don't you see? But this comes first. This is our only chance. I'll get fired, Gladys. Why, there isn't a newspaper in the world that would hire me as an office boy, would they, Bill? Not if they know you like I do. What do you mean, Gladys, do you remember poor Ed Glover? Do you remember after he lost that libel suit, they found his car gone over a cliff and a revolver in his hand? Gladys, do you want me to kill myself? Did you change your insurance? Would I ask you to do this thing for me if I didn't consider you practically as my wife? Well, would you ask your wife to hook up with that ape? But Gladys is overruled. Haggerty successfully arranges her marriage to Chandler. And the stage is set. Chandler is to sail for Europe, by coincidence to meet the Allenberries and accompany them on their return voyage to New York. According to Haggerty's best laid plans, Chandler catches up with the Allenberries, and now we find Bill and Connie in adjacent deck chairs on top side of the Queen Anne. Bill opens the conversation. Remember me? Oh, yes. I just left Father. He's waiting for you. Oh, well, he won't mind waiting. You don't know Father. Well, I won't detain you. Goodbye, Mr. Chandler. Good. Then cocktails in my stateroom at 7. Hmm? In your stateroom? Mm-hmm. 
Oh, I see. Your stateroom at seven. That's right, my stateroom at seven. Splendid. Oh, all right. Until then. <laughs> but Connie was not to be so easily ensnared. Smart girl, Connie. She failed to appear for cocktails at seven. And on the moonlit deck later that evening, Chandler tries new tactics. Hello. The inevitable Mr. Chandler. How was the cocktail party? Delightful. Then everything went off all right. Oh, yes. In fact, I'm glad now that you didn't come. Oh, you are? By the change of heart? Well, you're so fragile. Fragile? Yes, you damage so easily. Damage? Sues for five million dollars. That fascinates me. Asks five million dollars damages. So the Burns Nobles told you. It gave me a new light on you. Who is this marvel, I said? Florence Nightingale? Jeanne d'Arc? What has she done to earn such a precious reputation? Found a cure for death and taxes? Aren't you being a little absurd? Aren't you? Oh, wait a minute. You don't understand. Oh, do be careful. It might break. I'm not accustomed to handling anything so delicate, so valuable. That should be touched only by royalty, dukes, earls. As a matter of fact, you should be kept under glass. Bill's new technique earned him no more than a slap. And after getting nowhere fast with Connie Allenberry on shipboard, he is back in New York, confessing to Gladys and Haggerty his failure to put anything over on a girl a little bit smarter than he was. And that, my friends, is the last I saw of Miss Connie until we reached New York. Five days on a boat and she slaps your face. That's fine progress. So the wonder boy lays an egg. <laughs> Will you hush your girlfriend? Say, listen, nobody's hushing me. I've got my ticket to Reno, my reservation at the hotel, and even my lawyer. Postpone only. A million to one, you never see the Allenbury's again. You lose. He's already invited me for a weekend of fishing. What, just you and her father? What do I do, bust in on you and the old man? Oh, Connie will be there all right. I'll take bets on that, too. That wasn't any farewell slap. Chandler's next move in his pursuit of Connie Allenberry provides comedy so riotous you can't laugh fast enough to keep up with the fun, the romance, and the excitement. It makes Libel Lady the gayest, brightest comedy in months. Who can guess the ending of this merry mix-up of matrimonial misadventures? On this program, you heard William Powell, Myrna Loy, Jean Harlow, Spencer Tracy, Walter Connolly, glorious stars of Libel Lady, and the Metro-Golden-Mare Symphonic Orchestra under the direction of Dr. William Axe.